Today's world of knowledge is an explosion of printed information, electronic writing, and a seemingly infinite store of interconnected words on a computer-based web. So illiteracy, a person's inability to read the written word, must surely be a very debilitating condition. It is hard to imagine how a consumer could function today without the ability to read. But what if you take a fully literate consumer, literate that is, in his or her own society, and immerse this person in a completely alien culture, a culture where the spoken language is different, the writing is different, and even the ways of buying and selling are sometimes different. How would such a consumer survive? What coping strategies would this consumer use? What barriers would there be to this consumer's standard of living or even quality of life? Let's find out. You and I can read the Japanese brand name embroidered on my sweatshirt because it is written in Latin characters. But anything that is written in one of Japan's three alphabets, kanji, hiragana, and katakana, is completely alien to my experience as a learner and consumer who is literate only in English. It takes a Japanese child 12 years to master these three writing systems. Kanji, the Chinese-like characters, and the closest thing uh, approaching the English language alphabet, hiragana and katakana. In effect, by being a consumer in Japan and not schooled in Japanese, I can instantly make myself illiterate. And what is it like to be illiterate in Japan? How does it feel and how does it impact my choices and decisions in the marketplace? I recall that my first two months of living in Japan were immensely stressful. Most of the familiar environmental and interpersonal cues from my English-speaking Western culture were absent. And this put a damper on my activities and plans as a consumer in Japan. Activities that I would normally have considered routine suddenly became major challenges, sometimes even frightening ones. I would anticipate the consequences of making a mistake, and this would often be enough to dissuade me from initiating a shopping trip or consumption occasion. What if I got lost on the subway system? Or what if nobody at the camera store could understand my technical questions in English? And since the Japanese don't name their streets or number their houses, what if I couldn't find my friend's house in order to drop by for a social drink and then go out to dinner? You get the picture. Well, let's find out by going shopping. But first, we will need some money, specifically cash. Unlike the situation in America and Canada, Japanese consumers do not have checkbooks and don't write checks. In everyday purchases, they have two payment options, hard cash, which is by far the most common way of paying, and the almighty credit card. So cash it is. Let's go to a bank and open an account so I can get an ATM card for those money machines that are available everywhere in Japan. This is a branch of the UFJ Bank, right in my neighborhood. It's close to where I work and just 500 yards from the apartment where I live. So here is where I decided to open a personal bank account. 
My instinct told me that the procedure would be a prickly one, and I was not disappointed. Anticipating that there would be forms to fill in, and that everything would be printed in Japanese, I arranged to have a companion with me who was fluent in English and Japanese. So, the forms were filled out for me in Japanese, and I signed my life away. Or so it felt, not being able to read anything but the line I was putting my signature on. I opened the account with a deposit of 5,000 yen, and about 10 days later, my ATM card arrived in the mail. I tested it at my bank. It was rejected by the ATM. I can't read, but I was clearly following the icon-based instructions that the machine was giving me. Insert the card, magnetic stripe upwards and to the right, key in your password, and tell the machine how much cash you want. But the card is rejected. But I was inserting the card wrong way up. Unnoticed by me at the time was a tiny arrow in one corner of the card and next to it, something I couldn't read. The card needed to be inserted arrow side up and to the right. That's not what the machine says, but that is what the card says. I don't know what all this writing says, but I have learned to touch the top left-hand button for withdrawing cash, and that's the only procedure that I dare to try on the ATM. <laughs> Well, it took exactly one month and six visits to the bank in order to have ATM access to my money. How did I manage in the meantime? I borrowed cash from friends and hid it inside the proverbial pillow back at my apartment. And how do I keep track of my account? the good old-fashioned passbook, which I can't read anyway. All the transaction entries are printed out in Japanese. I'm standing outside a medium-sized supermarket named Jumbo. I have a short shopping list, so let's go inside and shop. Inside, you will find many of the features that are familiar to Western food shoppers. Aisles with shelving stocked with foods, refrigerated display cases containing dairy products, fish, and meats, fruit and vegetable stands, and end of aisle displays. But the advertised price specials and the voice on the public address system announcing promoted products are in Japanese only. And of course, many of the products and brands are not familiar to me. But I have a shopping list, so let's see how I cope. First on my shopping list, yogurt. It seems I have several brands to choose from, but how do I know that these are yogurt? There's nothing on here to tell me in English that this is a brand of yogurt. Well, I have two cues from the shopping environment to help me guess correctly. A refrigerated display case and the shape of this container. Cues that I have learned to use in my shopping environment back home. This feels cold and the cardboard container looks like it might contain yogurt. So which brand will I buy? Is it plain yogurt or fruit flavored? 
Is it low fat or regular? Is it set style or creamy? Is it sweetened or unsweetened? It's all there in Japanese. I won't be able to tell until I buy it and try it. And if I like it, I'll need to remember the colors and shapes on the label. And when I do get home, there's a surprise awaiting me under the lid. A packet of icing sugar in case I want to sweeten the yogurt. A Japanese innovation that I won't find back home. How do I know it's sugar? It says so in English. Next on my list, instant coffee. Several brands to choose from, but this decision is easy. I recognize this brand. And this particular variety, Gold Blend, is my favorite one back home. Here's a product that I recognize from supermarkets in Australia. Crab meat. Well, it's not really crab meat, but probably some kind of white fish flavored with crab. The only English words on this packet are salad style. Not very informative, but I'll use that as the brand name. Thanks to the transparent film over the package, I can see that the meat has been cleverly shaped as if extricated from the shell of a crab's claws. And it's artificially colored to look exactly like crab meat. As is the case with their cars and motorcycles, the Japanese are ingenious at designing, creating, and offering Western-style manufactured foods that fool your taste buds and look appealing. But here is where I would run into trouble. From the picture on the package, I can tell it is some kind of sauce mix. But everything on the package, including the instructions for preparation and serving, is in Japanese, in all three alphabets. I'm sure it tastes good if prepared correctly, but I wouldn't have a clue what to do. Here is a situation where a picture is worth a thousand Japanese characters. This looks like fruit and vegetable juice, which needs no preparation and is ready to drink. And judging from the picture, it contains the juices of apples, carrots, radishes, green pepper, orange, lemon, celery. That's good enough for illiterate me. Two more items on my shopping list and then we're done. One is distinctly Japanese, and the other is international. Noodles, the Japanese equivalent of angel hair pasta. I recognize this from eating at Japanese restaurants. And preparing this food would not be rocket science. Boil some water, dump in the noodles, and give them a few minutes to cook. Easy. So what's written on the label in Japanese would not be critical. And last on my list, a very international food. I'm in a small, independently run baked goods shop. This food needs no labels or packaging. Freshly baked French baguette. Hey, I got the huh? 200. Oh, 10. 10, sorry. <laughs> Arigato. Hey, Arigato. 210 yen. That's about $1.75 US currency. Japan's passenger train system is a marvel of local accessibility, automated convenience, and punctuality. You literally can set your watch by the times that a train arrives at or leaves from any given station. 
But the system of train travel needs to be mastered. The learning starts with how do I buy a ticket? And just about everything I learned in order to travel without fear was done by at first making mistakes. Trial and error conditioning. First, I need to know the fare from this station to my destination. I'm going from Hagoromo to Sakai Station. So that shows me 200 yen. So here's my 200 yen coins. And into the machine. The buttons light up. I press the figure for 200. And out comes my ticket. Thankfully, every train station and subway stop has its name given in three alphabets. At the top in hiragana, below that in kanji, and below that in the alphabet I can read. At the back of my ticket is a magnetic film in which has been encoded my station of origin and the fare paid. As I exit the station, the turnstile machine will be checking whether I've paid the correct fare. Eating out in Japan is a breeze. Thanks to this uniquely Japanese idea, rubber chicken, plastic noodles, and silicone mushrooms. Most restaurants display their menu in the window with realistic looking replicas of exactly what you will be served. What a marvelous way to avoid disappointments. What you see is what you will get. But once you have made a choice, how do you transfer that information to your waitress? If you're in my situation, you can't read the name of the dish written on the tag below. So that leaves just two options, abstain from enjoyment or Since the price is the only thing I can read, I showed her this, just to be sure. And she said something like, uh-huh. Eureka. Exactly what the doctor ordered. Get plenty of rest, drink lots of fluids, and take as many delicacies as you can stand. When I first tried Japanese food many years ago, I didn't like it. Now, I have learned to love it and have a repertoire of favorite dishes. The same is true of Chinese. I wasn't raised on Chinese food, but I gradually acquired a taste for it. So today, I decided to try this modern looking Chinese restaurant. No lifelike food replicas in the window. In fact, no display windows at all. No pictures of the dishes inside the menu. Just the selections available today, printed in Chinese and Japanese only. For illiterate me, this would seem like a dead end. I hope this is not the beginning of a trend among restaurants in Japan. But there is a saving grace. Our camera operator, Grace Gao, is fluent in Chinese, Japanese, and English. That's a dynamite combination in this part of the world. So I'm going to invite her to lunch and she can do the translating. I didn't learn to use chopsticks in Japan. 
That skill developed gradually over the years by going to Chinese restaurants and challenging myself to master the sticks. I'm on my way to the apartment where I live. Throughout Japan, it is not customary to name streets and number houses. But at all four corners of a residential block, you will find one of these. It gives the town's name, the district, and a sort of zip code or postal code for that block. Residential blocks in smaller towns and cities are typically six to eight houses square, while city blocks in the downtown areas of a metropolis are the same size as blocks in Montreal, Chicago, or London. And the easiest method to find your way is by the names of the buildings, occasionally written in English. This is the apartment block where I live in the Hagoromo district of Takaishi city, a satellite town of greater Osaka. 17 apartments, 16 of them currently occupied, with monthly rents ranging between 100,000 yen and 122,000 yen, depending on what you can negotiate with the landlord. Renting an apartment is a long and complicated process and not to be attempted alone by an illiterate prospective tenant. I had lots of local help from people who knew Japanese and English when I settled on the rent and signed the contract. Every tenant gets a mailbox and almost every day of the week mine gets stuffed with an ever-growing flood of junk mail. Most of these I cannot read, so I bring a garbage bag when I empty my mailbox. Occasionally, I can figure out what they are trying to sell. Like these here, competing services for sex. Don't come to us, we'll come to you. 81% of the tenants here are families with young children, young married couples, or retired people. Yet every single mailbox will get stuffed with one of these. I call it just in case market segmentation. Let's give everybody one of these just in case we might stumble upon a new customer. How do I know it's prostitution? A smattering of English words on one of the leaflets. Sexy, kiss, club, 9 a.m. to 6 a.m. 50 minutes, 10,000 yen, 80 minutes, 20,000 yen, 120 minutes, 30,000 yen. And there's a telephone number to call. Would you like me to read you the number? Just in case? Here's an example of where my illiteracy makes me quite useless to my local community. I didn't know what all this said until somebody translated for me. This nine-year-old girl disappeared on the afternoon of May 20, on her way home from school, not far from where I live. It seems that the entire city of Osaka has been alerted to this missing person case. I'm off to visit a camera store in Osaka, so this time I need to go to Namba Station. Here's my home station, Hagoromo, and I need to get to Namba Station. So, according to the black numbers, the fare I need to pay is 370 yen. This is Namba Station, a major passenger rail terminus which serves the southern half of Osaka. It is truly a bewildering buyer-seller environment, especially since most of what one sees is written in Japanese and displayed in a Japanese manner. My task is to find the Naniwa camera store, roughly three kilometers by foot from here. I've been there twice before, the first time with a guide. On that first foray, I try to develop an episodic memory, the memory for a sequence of events, as well as an iconic memory, the memory for places, things, and names. And all of that in order to build a mental map of how to get there from here. And now the time has come to test that memory. First, down this arcade all the way to the end. 
This is where I need to make a right turn using big camera as my marker. How do I know it's big camera? Because below the yellow writing, it says bigbig.com. I need to go through the store to the street on the other side and then make a right turn. Now, down this arcade to the end and then make a left turn. How do I know that this is where I make a left turn? Because I look for two markers. A funny looking Japanese character above me and there's always a movie poster on the wall above. Now, down this narrow street and then I'll have to look for a marker to make my right turn. Here is my marker for another right turn. That building over there, 100 yen plaza. And now my marker for a second right turn and entry into this street. That computer store over there, soft map. Well, I made it all the way to Naniwa Camera, all by myself, using a store of episodic and iconic memories. I relied on those to create a mental map and literally had to wade through a completely alien information environment in order to get here.